Okay. Hi guys, welcome to round three of UBDC. My name is Jay and from Yukimara and I'll be your chair for the round. My friend Yukimara, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm going to examine the Okay. Um, at this moment, before we start the debate, in Prop PLS1, you can want to pop out with anyone like to um, state a preferred gender pronoun for the round? I'll prefer it. I'll just say Yeah. Alright, cool. Great. Alright. Um, this gentleman here will be helping us with time. Without further ado, I'll let you invite the prime minister to start. Here. 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 What? North Korea's threat of intercontinental ballistic missiles gets more and more progressive by the day. They test warheads, with, even with the threat of economic sanctions. And we say that as South Korea, we cannot simply risk depending on the United States um, using Taad, for example, or even depending on the United States to stop North Korea, or even depending on the nuclear arms race, or arms race that Trump wants at the end of the day. In fact, Madam Speaker, we say that the U.S. has become more and more unreliable. How do we say, why do we say this? Because we say that Trump's unpredictable and out of the blue actions have been like uh, becoming a trend recently. He pulled out of the TPP, for example. He closed borders for immigrants, for example. And he even wanted to decrease participation in NATO and even went to leave its allies vulnerable in the face of the threat and in, the, in terms of sacrificing um, their interests for its own. Therefore, Speaker, we see that the U.S. The, the trend of United States now has become more and more isolated and self-interested and cutting off political ties at the end of the day. At this point, South Korea is, is at the crossroads. It has to choose between a blind faith on U.S. and assume everything will work out, or or Madam Speaker, is it time to change strategy and protect itself and ally with someone who's geographically closer, but more importantly, someone who is eco who is um, becoming econo um, more politically and economically more progressive at the end of the day. What then does closer economic, political, and military ties mean? Coming from government side, firstly, we're willing to go to more military exercises with China, for example. We're willing to cooperate with China's Maritime Silk Road, which is a plan to connect um, ports and trade uh, ports and tradeways throughout Asia, with, and ch which China pledged $25 billion to its success. We're also willing to cater to multilateral talks and negotiations for better diplomatic relations over the years. The goal is simple coming from side uh, uh, proposition. We say that the goal is the stability of South Korea economic and politically and even safety and security of our, our government and citizens if there are no points okay. coming from so obviously the motion also says even at the expense of the u.s so what kind of benefits are we willing to renege away from the u.s precisely and that's where my first argument is we say the united states is no longer a reliable ally despite the benefits it has given us historically but i'm going to analyze this in two levels firstly politically um, politically militarily and even um, economically later on let's go to the first politically we say much like um what was tackled a while ago united states has a chance of closing itself from the world that is to say um, tr um trump's goal at the end of the day and his administration has to give them more jobs for americans to even have protectionist policies and it's clear um that uh, and it's uh, it's it's clear that in the time of his administration it's all about making sure that the u.s becomes an economic power uh, uh, an, econo uh, an economic powerhouse and even even at the expense of allies at the end of the day. What does this mean for South Korea? We say that it potentially loses its trading relations to the United States. Um, even if um, at the, uh, even if in status quo, this um, trading relations and economic relations is strong, we say that at the end of the day, you're, all, you're ultimately going to lose that trading relations precisely because of the, uh, of, of the trend of being protectionist of the United States at the end of the day. We don't think that we can rely on that even in the future. But furthermore, um, militarily speaking, we say that the, the threat of North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missiles can now reach Alaska, Madam Speaker. At the end of the day, 
it, historically, the reason why United States supported South Korea militarily because it assumed a position of invulnerability against N North Korea. That is to say, it thought that it was unreachable because of geography and that then North Korea's nuclear co capabilities were lesser. Now that it can reach Alaska, Madam Speaker, the threat is realer. The threat is something that has increased and the United States focuses its efforts on protecting itself against um, North Korea. And we see that it's even willing to take out uh, South Korea's interests precisely because um, pre precisely because Trump is now more uh, more than willing to have a nuclear arms race against North uh, against North Korea at the end of the day. Which means that the Madam Speaker, at, at the end of the day, South Korea is no longer under the U.S. Um, nuclear umbrella. And we say that because it knows that it's attacked, therefore it will focus on its own self interest and let go of South Korea if it has to. Why is that something that's harmful? Because it, in, now that Trump's more and more willing to have a nuclear arms race and to even have a, a nuclear clear war at the end of the day. We say that um, its interest is not to protect South Korea, but to protect itself. Given that Trump is even willing to have a nuclear arms race to begin with, already tells us that South Korea will just be a casualty, that South Korea is someone who is willing to protect, uh, given that it does not consider how close it is to North Korea at the end of the day. So even with the existence of benefits, we don't think that it's likely for us to actually continue these benefits. And we say that the, therefore the situations are bad now for sorry, South Korea and in the future we think that it's going to be worse if you continue this uh, alliance with um, the uh, United States. In fact, Madam Speaker, the reason why North Korea is aggressive towards South Korea is because of um, its, um, its um, continuous relations with the United States. The reason why um, North Korea is hostile is because of um, uh, United States military activity and exercise with South Korea. If we decrease our military um, alliance with the United States, we are, um, uh, we, there's, it's, it's uh, more likely that North Korea will um, become less hostile at the end of the day. But second argument, we say that alliance with China is better for South Korea's interest. Um, and, um, economically speaking, we say uh, uh, China spends um, about $10 trillion to maintain its soft power with other countries. This includes um, the $25 billion for the Silk Road and the $40 billion for the, um, for the economic belt that um, is currently um, uh, that it's currently trying to establish. And we say that in the short term, we uh, uh, with um, increased economic relations with China, we increase trade, which allows us to have uh, to actually protect um, econ uh, ourselves economically. But in the long term, Madam Speaker, it allows us access to further development and trade relations with China's economic partners. Now uh, we say, um, in fact, even militarily, China being a partner of North Korea um, we, is, is something that's also beneficial for South Korea, no matter how counterintuitive that sounds. Why is that the case? Because expanding China's military influence to both Korea nations forces it to ensure stability and lessening the conflict within the region that is to say it's not in china's interest for a for a war between uh, for a war to escalate between north korea and south korea as of the moment this means that south korea as a military ally of china also allows south korea access to the same military backing that north korea has at the end of the day therefore madam speaker we say that if china has a, an economic and military and political interest in south korea north Korea is less likely to be hostile and aggressive towards South Korea because North Korea will not risk its relations with China at the end of the day. It's too big of a risk. And with all these things in consideration, we're very proud to propose. Thank you very much. To Ladies and gentlemen, in order to understand this debate, we have to look at current trends, what's happening today, and how exactly these actors take place. Because if we listen to the previous speaker, they just assume, based on completely separate information, that the U.S. will act a different way, that China will act this way and like that. But we tell you, come from opposition, we have to understand specifically 
what are U.S. interests in South Korea and the East Asia region and the other players at hand to China, North Korea, and Japan? Because coming from government, they told us that U.S. is, ab is going to abandon South Korea because now North Korea could reach Alaska. But that's not true because last week, U.S. gave South Korea an anti-ICBM missile defense system precisely to counter the news of of North Korea's developments with its missile technology. If that's what you call going to start abandoning, if that's what you call going to abandon its ally in South Korea, we think that what else should the US do in order to quote unquote not abandon but help South Korea and going to defend itself from North Korea. What, 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 is, what is a clash coming from the leader of opposition? It's very simple. First, we think in the short term, the South Korean interest is to maintain status quo and and have its maintain its US, U.S. relationship politically, economically, and militarily. And second, we think it's also harmful in the long term for the, the South Korea to potentially abandon ties with the U.S. and completely be dependent on China because we think that that delivers more long-term vulnerabilities at the end of the day, especially when you embrace the sphere of China. Before, uh, uh, the, my two arguments are simple. One, we think that by going closer to China and uh, letting go of some, some parts of US our relationship will not reduce tension and we think it will actually add tension militarily in that, in that region. And the second argument is about the robustness of the US economy and we, why we think that China, uh, that South Korea should maintain its relationship with the US and not embrace totally China's offers, right? Before I move arguments, I'll rebut the previous speaker. Uh, what, did, what did she tell us? She told us that it's about U.S. reliability, that the U.S. can't be relied on because it abandoned the TPP because it has immigration and is abandoning NATO. We agree that, for example, that the U.S. might have sh uh, shot TPP down. We agree that they might be less friendly on immigration and we agree that they might be unfriendly on NATO system. But when it comes to South Korea, especially, they don't. Trump doesn't want China to grow. Trump doesn't want China to get more allies at the expense of U.S. trade. That's why he keeps on saying that we need the best deal against bad China, right? That's why we think when it comes to Trump, when it comes specifically to that region, we don't think that all the premises really hold water. But even if it does, we think that what will happen, especially when you let go of U.S. economic ties and embrace China. We think that their, specu their speculations of China are, ba or are, only are only predictions of what the Belt Road Initiative can do. But according to analysts, the $50 billion that China has invested in the Belt Road Initiative they expect that 50% of it will be lost to corruption or other things at a, at a sound cost. So when it comes to the reliability of the Chinese economy, is China really a good partner in economics, a good alternative, for example, the US? We don't necessarily think so, right? But the second argument she told us is that how going to China will necessarily reduce tension in this uh, in the region, right? And this, and, and, um, and this leads to my first argument, why we don't think it will really diffuse tension at all. Because the assumption of the assumption of government is that China will completely embrace South Korea, that they will have no apprehensions at all. We think that yes, they might be closer, but what the extent of the effectivity and trust that will happen within these two countries, right? We think that firstly, we are, what, what will China really do if North Korea tries to invade or try to threaten more um, South Korea, right? Will they send military troops in order to stop North Korea, uh, North Korea from stopping to threaten South Korea? We don't necessarily think so, because North Korea, even if South Korea was friendly to it during the Sunshine Policy in 1998 and 2007, when they built the Kisong Industrial Plan to give infusions and aid without anything in exchange to North Korea, North Korea didn't budge and just continued to develop its missile systems and continue to threaten South Korea with its missile test. We think that what's the likelihood of North Korea to even stop threatening this uh, uh, South Korea, especially when they see that there might be a reduction of U.S. bases set out. There might be a reduction of U.S. bases because that's the trade-off that you have to make, that you will lose U.S. bases in South Korea. So if North Korea sees a vulnerability that they can't defend themselves as completely as before, 
What exactly will stop North Korea from attacking or threatening South Korea with its displays? We think that the likelihood is very, very high that they will not stop and actually further intensify the tension. So we think that will it really defuse tensions? We don't think so, right? But the second argument for what yes. Why is North Korea less likely to provoke a South Korea-China relationship compared to a North South Korea-US relationship? Because we think that it's still, they're still against South Korea, not necessarily just the U.S., but also South Korea. That's why we think that when it comes to that geopolitical sphere, we think that North Korea still has an incentive to scare South Korea from giving more, capitulating to more demands, right? But the second argument is about the robustness of the U.S. economy, right? We think that when you analyze China right now, when it comes to trends, right, we have to look at trends of what's going to happen and the likelihood of what's going to happen in government. The trends right now is that China is a suffering birthing pains of a consumer-based economy. It's unstable, they're not transparent. The people report that we don't even know what how China calculates its GDP. We don't, no one knows exactly what's happening in the transparency of Chinese business. So when you look at South Korea, can they really rely on China's economy in the short term to begin with? We don't think so because at the end of the day, when it comes to making businesses, even if they um, even if they reduce ties recently with uh, US when it comes to the TPP, we feel that US is still a better ally at the day. But what else is the implication here? If China and South Korea become closer militarily, politically, and economically, that will also trigger Japan, which also has bitter ties with China and the Sinkaku and Yangu Islands. By putting these kinds of geopolitical tensions together by, in, by making, by when Japan sees China is getting closer to South Korea, how exactly will the geopolitical sphere, economic sphere turn out? We think that this adds tension and it's not really a good, sustainable and reliable partner for the South Korea at the end of the day. With that, we're very proud to propose. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now more than ever, is the United States more self-interested than it's interested in other nations? That's why its current interest in, these, in South Korea is more of a personal one, to which that in, it, in, the, in the sense that when the United States can no longer protect itself by using South Korea as a block to North Korea's long missile testing, we think that's when the United States will be willing to cut it off. But even in the instance where China finally does overcome the economy of the United States, which we fully think it is early, already on the process, or if it not, already has surpassed the economy of the United States, we think that South Korea therefore has an interest to shift these ties to, South, to China and not to the United States anymore. The first thing I want to clear up, coming from the previous speaker, was that he fully assumed that North Korea only hates South Korea, and that on either side, South Korea isn't better off. Why is that something that's flawed? Because that means that, firstly, its current in South Korea's relationship with the United States doesn't ex um, provide anything exclusive to South Korea under their model, because it assumes that North Korea doesn't care about its relationship with, with the US. But we said, therefore, that even if you take a look at these trends, there's patterns that 
North Korea isn't attacking China or being aggressive towards China. It's being aggressive towards the United States primarily and testing in the waters of Japan and South Korea. And when it's ready to launch, like the same way that it has ICBMs and other nuclear warheads at the border of North Korea and South Korea, we think North Korea does not just hate South Korea, but it hates it because of its relationship with the United States. Analyze that there is no distinction characterization why this is true coming from the leader of opposition. And and probably then he's gonna come up here and tell us why. But you tell us the reason why North Korea primarily hates the United States is it thinks that democracy is a threat to its regime. But meaning that when it is when South Korea is friends with China, it's less likely to be an aggressor to its mother, the person it trades the most with. Comparatively with the United States, it doesn't care as North Korea. Yes. So. Even if it is friends with China, do you think South Korea is still going to maintain the democratic regime? Because if yes, then North Korea will still find a big reason to not like them. No, but note how South Korea has no interest in influencing the politics of North Korea as much as the United States is. The United States is actively intervening within North Korea compared to spread the democracy, but South Korea isn't taking the same extreme measures as the United States. Meaning, if we do tone down how like the United States has interacted, because South Korea has no interest in pushing its democratic agenda, but rather just wants stability. And it, in that POI, he also assumed that North South Korea will automatically change regimes the same way like China and North Korea behaves, which we don't think is something that will happen under their side of the debate. The second thing that came out from the previous speaker was this whole idea that, you know, like the consumer-based economy of China is really weak. Really, I'm pretty sure that the reason why U.S. feels challenged by China's economy is because China is flourishing. China is reaching to multiple other countries and extending its trading regions. That's why the establishment of the Pakistan Corridor or the Maritime Silk Road and all the other Silk Roads that China wants to establish is the fact that China is a growing economy for that matter. But even if, let's assume, the point is, Madam Chair, that the fact that the Yuan was added to the IMF shows that there is stability to the currency and to the economy of China as a reliable trading currency. No. What therefore do I want to extend? Why we think that China's interest over, stock of, over South Korea is one that South Korea can benefit from and in fact exploit when it comes to the negotiation tables. Three reasons, two reasons why we think China hates the US and it's willing to do anything to get allies from the United States to get allies away from the United States. The first is the military exercises and the presence of the, um, the Sa'ad, which is this high altitude ability to destroy nuclears and whatnot. So what we think, therefore, is that the fact that these military exercises are in the waters close to China threatens China in itself, meaning that when South Korea participates, in fact, my previous partner told you that China was willing to enforce upon North Korea sanctions or ways to to downplay its nuclear arsenal just so that South Korea will downplay its military exercises with the U.S. as well. Shows that the threat of China and that military of the U.S. is one that China is willing to back on and do whatever it can. Meaning that in the same way that the relationship between China and the Philippines is one that's growing and the Philippines is stirring away from the United States means that at worst, the only reason why you, the Philippines will get a shit deal is because the Philippines doesn't have much leverage other than the fact that um, the U.S. is failing them. But best case, what the Philippines will therefore get is something better than the U.S. is already offering them. And only China can offer a better bargain. And we think that the same way, South Korea can exploit that. Because if China generally hates the United States, we tell you that with South Korea's economic stability and high purchasing capacity, China therefore has to offer a better offer, uh, offer something better to South Korea comparatively to the U.S. And note how it's not a so Trump has no incentive to offer anything better to South Korea because if it opens up more trading capacities, it sacrifices the jobs that it promised to bring home. And we think that therefore, that in that economic battle, China is willing to open its borders up and in fact to opening up its trade routes to allow South Korea a slice of that cake. But lastly, we think that because South Korea can now bait China to assess how much China hates the United States, that they will offer whatever it can to, the, to South Korea, we think that's a bargaining leverage that we should take. And if it's something that's favorable, we should actively shift to China, therefore. In fact, 
United States needs us more to protect itself from North Korea and a doorway to Asia. If China is able to do the United States one better and we benefit more, which I think is highly likely given that South North Korea, I mean, China has done whatever it can to influence the politics away from the United States in various countries, we think that China will be our best option and we can get something better. Therefore, in the interest of South Korea economically, we tell you that it has a bigger access to a stable market within China than sailing across the sea to the United States of America. But second, in terms of the influence of China over North Korea, it's clear that there is a link between preventing North Korea from being aggressive to South Korea because of its relations with China rather than the United States' influence over North Korea, which we think is one that's unaffected and second, will be abandoned and we will be forced to fight for our own if we don't turn to China sooner than later. We can see America has not been the poster boy for mutual economic development or the protection of political systems and democracy. But if we look at the trend of China right now, while they are attempting to use soft power for the creation of maritime and land-based economic belts, they are also backing that up with neo-imperialist measures such as threatening other countries with the deployment of military forces around that region. We're talking about countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and even the Philippines. We are also talking about the establishment of human rights regimes that are not generally respected. Like generally, they have to answer the question, why are we willing to trust China, which well, systematically oppresses uh, minorities like the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, with protecting political stability in the region, which is premised on the protection of human rights. So I will generally extend this debate on compare on two levels. Firstly, I will talk about how South Korea is going to get a really bad economic deal because its economic systems of China are generally not stable. Papad kind of dismiss this, I'm going to show you why. But secondly, I'm going to talk about how there leads to, there leads to greater regime instability around South Korea because China is not someone that will want to protect strong democratic regimes. But two things I want to resolve coming from the entire government bench. The first issue, just to kill it dead, right? Can China locate North Korea? Because the leader of opposition only argument until 549, I hope you had the time, was that North Korea's ICBMs are scary and that the U.S. is so scared that they're running away and leaving um, North, South, North, South Korea out of the out of the nuclear um, umbrella. Firstly, that's actually untrue, right? So generally mentioned that on BBC News this morning, they already installed like a new missile defense system. But even if that weren't true, let's think of the logic, right? If she says herself that Alaska is now within reach, reach within ICBMs, why would they take away a missile defense system from literally the closest peninsula, the closest country in that region? Generally, it is anyone's interest, even America's interest, to make sure their threats are contained. We think South Korea is still within their interest. We think oh, even South Korea is still within there. That's why Trump made, a prior, made it a priority to deal with North Korean sanctions. We don't think it is logical for them to leave out South Korea. But secondly, an actual comparative of Chinese military, because we had a one-minute a one assertion that China has the military anyway. Here's the comparative that Jet with, never responded to. The U.S. has a thing called strategic lift, meaning it has the literal ability to bring its military force from one end of the world to the other because it has bases everywhere. More pe people don't trust the U.S. that much, but they still trust it more than China. There's a reason you do not hear of a China sp Chinese base in Africa or South American waters. It's because countries do not want a Chinese presence there. Take, for example, like force projection, right? Right? You heard, you saw the info slide on the CPEC, right? But just recently as well, India also deployed 10,000 troops along the same corridor because they do not trust Chinese presence in that region. We think the kind of force projected that China is used to is something that is not very good or that's not very uh, capable as a, sur as a surgical projection against South North Korea. And even then, what exactly are the benefits that, South, that, South, that China can bring? Like, if they said so themselves that China is not going to invade, then obviously, like, North Korea still has the capacity to destroy South Korea 
Korea with conventional means. I do not see a comparative as to how China can contain that. But secondly, can China be trusted? Because all they generally said that right now, Trump is a kind of bad person, and we don't want to be able to compare that. On three levels, why do we think this is wrong? Firstly, it is blatantly false for Papa to say that North and South Korea has no influence in it's no influence in being able to influence North Korea. Um, there is a reason we have refugee propaganda systems within South Korea because they eventually want to reunite and make sure that South North Korea becomes unstable. Secondly, they cannot dismiss the multiple economic stabilities that Jet mentioned. Generally speaking, you do not want to trust a country that doesn't know how to report the GDP figures or generally allows corruption to run within both private and public businesses. South Korea as a financial center of the world wants transparency, wants good government regulations. We do not think they want to get into that. But conversely, if their logic is that China hates the US and eventually once they leave, China will be good, then conversely, the US hates China as well and will probably put sanctions as well. But they have yet to give a proper comparative as to why the trade-off of get, taking away US benefits will not be, will leave South Korea relatively unscathed or why the benefits of China, a generally corrupt system, will be able to make up for it. So let's go to the extension, right? Firstly, why do we think that South Korea has generally a geopolit has geopolitical weakness in economic negotiations? Here's the trend, right? We think generally China has been making its so-called soft power coming from them um, in their economic projects with a lot of hard power and a lot of force projection. Like, for example, in developing Asia, China has generally postured against governments to stop interfering with its programs like the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or the Maritime Sea Belt because generally they want as much governmental or Chinese control over the development of businesses there. And we think countries in general do not take kindly to that because they want their own businesses and their own territory protected. That's why you'll see a lot of force, like a lot of military troops already in Pakistan or Sri Lanka resisting China through negotiation. What is the comparative there? Clearly the comparative is if South Korea tries to go with China, then obviously it is getting into a huge money sink, right? Like for example, the EIB is projected to lose at least 50% of most of its initial investments across like five or 10 years because the countries they want to invest in, like in Central Asia, are generally so corrupt and so underdeveloped that they do not have the proper infrastructure to handle them. Meanwhile, the US, even if it might not be the US per se handling them, you still have sympathetic allies like Japan. Japan and like Australia that are still willing to talk with developed countries like South Korea. So on the comparative, it is less like, like if we stay with the US, you not only have a nuclear umbrella, but you also have a good bargaining chip with US allies that have their own developed economies, their own transparent economies that South Korea wants to engage in. But secondly, why do we think that political regimes or the political uh, stability of South Korea's region is less likely um, to be conclusive. Generally speaking, China has had a heavy hand in protecting human rights regimes, not only internally, but also externally. Internally, we are all talking about the, the, the systematic oppression of Muslim Uyghurs and Tibetans in the Western corridors of China. Um, fine, yes. What is the likelihood of China influencing a big nation like South Korea to link do all that human rights matter. But your argument was literally that because the U.S. is allies with South Korea, China has every incentive to be, if not sanctioned, at least be less favorable to the positions of South Korea. You cannot shift from one premise to the other in the same debate, Papa. Anyway, generally speaking, we also see a trend of the Chinese government allowing for human rights violations in its Chinese businesses. What's the argument? The argument is not like, you know, they will exploit South Korean businesses and poor people, right? The argument is simply that on the comparative, it is less likely for China to reign in the kinds of corruptions or reign in the kinds of violations that its businesses or its diplomats are likely to take with South Korean entities and South Korean businesses when they, when they negotiate. Which, which means if you leave the US nuclear umbrella or if you leave the US diplomatic pool, you are more likely to go into an arena of very brusque diplomats of companies that do not want to negotiate and generally that leads to a very unstable regime in the long run. So on the comparative, why are the trade-offs so much bigger on their side? Firstly, on the initial step, obviously you are cutting off a huge amount of trade for the next five to ten years. You'll have to restart it, you'll have to push out military bases, and you'll be left defenses for the next five to ten years. But in the long run, they have yet to prove that the kinds of economic and political regimes that China is setting up are likely to success be successful in the time period that they discuss. UPDA was the only team in this debate to actually provide a comparative. We will take this debate. Thank you very much. Love it.
There's one thing we have to remember in this debate is that South Korea is not like the other countries who have killed over to China. But coming from Papa's speech on his own, South Korea is a precious strategic point that even China is with like fight for willing to negotiate with and we think that point we said that we couldn't have so this is not analysis that we would be allied in China all of a sudden in your presence if I'm going to go from China China's and the Senate Department. regardless of what happens. But we don't think this type of blanket statement is going to cut it in this debate. Because let's look at it. Its interest in China is not absolute. Fine. Before, their interest was in staving off the fake communism within the region and the influence of democracy. At that time, when that interest was that, fine. South Korea made sense. But look at its current interest in China. When Trump is saying that China is meddling with the US economy and meddling with its jobs, its interest with China seems solely centered on the US itself and on its economic and trade relations. Sit down, it's all. Meaning, South Korea has no strategic stake in its current interest in China, and therefore the US doesn't seem even likely to even care about it anymore. But then the second, let's talk about economically then. Because they said that, you know, China is just so corrupt that we can't trust it, we can't deal with individuals, while the US is this bastion of transparency and democracy. First, we don't think that's true. Like, even the US, we think, has had its fault. It's been overly capitalistic. It's allowed its backs to do more than corruption. But more than that, look at it. Even the US does deals with China, but for some reason, the US is still able to maintain its current transparency standards. So we don't mean, so we don't think that just because you enter into a relation with China, that you are automatically forced to sit down to adopt its policy. We think at some point, South Korea is still capable, for example, for on its end, keeping businesses transparent. The businesses that it negotiates with China, for example, may be required to follow certain rules. We don't think just because it's a negotiation that China automatically gets to dictate all the rules. And that has been the assumption of their side the entire time. That the moment we engage with China, automatically we're completely under their wings when that's not even true. We don't have to 100% suck up. And the fact that we're an important leverage point means that we don't have to deal with all these harms and we can still impose these things. Comparatively, what have we told you about the US? That number one, Trump is unpredictable. A lot of the time he's been highly protectionist. Now they say this is just like a bunch of random data all around. But the thing is, we've never expected individuals to do that. And he's been consistent in his ability to withdraw from international agreements in relations and his unwillingness to honor these things. Given that this is his pattern of behavior, what makes you think we're, oh, he's going to just randomly stop at South Korea arbitrarily? We don't think South Korea has made itself to be any kind of special exception to that. But more than that, we've already talked to you about that China is at the very least a reliable and predictable actor. It's not someone that hasn't actually changed. So even if, fine, in the best case, the benefits we have of the U.S. exist. Now, because it's not reliable, it's not something we should prioritize, and therefore it's more important to go with a country we know has an interest in us and know has something we can predict. Yes? Yes, U.S. might be self-existent economically, but if you follow your policy, where South Korea would potentially cut ties to the U.S., is not following U.S. political and economic interests, therefore being reliant and still be with South Korean economic interests as well. But anyway, the point here is that, look, even if the U.S. cuts off ties with South Korea, it's something that wouldn't be inconsistent with Trump's current plans and goals to bring back jobs into the U.S. economy, to ensure that the individuals going in are U.S. alone, and essentially this U.S.-centric policy. It doesn't make sense to me why he's saying U.S.-centric, and all of a sudden they're saying, no, they still care about all the other countries out there. The point here is that the U.S. is not a relative. I'm
compared to the kind of leverage you can predict with China. That's why. But second issue then, is South Korea safe from North Korea even without the United States? Because they tell us that no, the moment that US leaves and its bases are gone, North Korea will attack. But this is untrue because that kind of analysis assumes that we're operating in a vacuum where it's only North Korea, South Korea, and the U.S. there, when we don't think that's true. Because the fact is, North Korea still cares about China and about China's interests because it's been its biggest trade partner. It's been the one willing to give it aid. It's essentially its representative in the international community. So we think, to an extent, North Korea still will care about the interests of China. And if currently, China and South Korea are entering into relations, and if currently China's economic plan contains South Korea, then it doesn't make sense for North Korea to shoot itself in the foot and essentially ruin relations with its only ally. So just because the UN is not there doesn't mean that North Korea will automatically fire missiles everywhere and South Korea will be obliterated from the face of the earth. That's not realistic, and that doesn't take into consideration North Korea's own interests with its other allies that it wants to maintain. But more than that, they tried to tell us that, you know what, well, the US and China, China can't compare to the US as like military at all. But we don't think that's even true in the first place. Like, look, China has 2.3 million troops compared to the US as 1.4. It's geographically closer and able to mobilize these types of things faster. It's far more willing and more interested in being able to step in when it concerns North Korea versus the US, who oftentimes has been very unwilling to even consider making hard and fast agreements about stepping in or things about mutual defense. Meaning that for one, the best case scenario, yeah, China can totally compete with the USS military, but even if it couldn't, the fact that China is probably more willing to use that military for South Korea's defense rather than just to tell South Korea, here's some technology, go defend yourself. We think we're much rather better and more reliable with China, and we think we're far safer. At the end of the day, this is about the future of South Korea. While we did have allies and while we did benefit with the U.S. interaction and with the U.S. alliance, that isn't just going to work out anymore. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, abortion. Something new. It's very easy to panic, and it's very easy to throw away a long-standing relationship with an ally in order for you to feel like you're safe from a very close danger. But what we would say is that the state is very different from us in the sense that it does not use the language of feelings, it uses the language of statistics. And statistically, ladies and gentlemen, the United States is so much better than China, they've never spotted any of these matters. Because you might agree that Currently, Trump really is unpredictable, we agree. But economically, militarily, they're far more stable than China. Politically, Trump is still against Chinese expansionism. But even in the worst case, right, Trump is still only there for four years. We've had so much backlash as to his presidency that we're going to have to shift from what he has today. The shift of alliances is long term and not the four years of the Trump's presidency. The reason why they lose this debate is because of their nitpicky characterization and dismissing matter when it's inconvenient for them. The first issue I want to talk about is will it really diffuse tension? Because you were expecting a lot of different matter about China and, North and South Korea. Instead, you gave they gave you a lot of matter, outdated matter, on North Korea. Because they said, you know what, it will diffuse tension because North Korea is very dangerous. And the only reason why they're so mean right now is because they, the South Korea has been allied 